Welcome to the ICC Nairobi podcast, where we are all about raising godly generations. We're so glad you're here, and we believe that wherever you're listening to us from, this word will bless and minister to you. This month, we are focusing on the book of Ephesians. And uh, so Pastor Jemima started us off last weekend as she led us in communion and covered a bit of Ephesians chapter 1. But I want to encourage you, Ephesians is just six chapters. It's not even the reading for the month. It's just the reading for this week. You know, if you can just make some time this week and read through the book of Ephesians. Six chapters, read them through as you go through the week. I believe that as the Pentecostal church, one of the things that we have to go back to is the discipline of reading God's word. The discipline of reading God's word. And I know that many of us, it's easy to spend time in prayer. But I believe it's just as important for us to spend time in God's word. Prayer and God's word are like the two wings of an aeroplane. As we spend time in God's presence, let's also spend time in his word. How do we get to know God? How do you get to know anyone? It's by spending time with that person. You spend time with that person. This person that was once a stranger, you spend time with them. You want to spend more time with them. In fact, you come to a place where you make some vows and you commit to spend the rest of your life together. Why? Because you've been spending time with them. We desire to know God. How do we know God? We know him through his word. We know him through revelation that comes out of his word. We know him as we spend time in prayer as we spend time in fellowship. That's why being part of a CG, a connecting group, is so important for us. Because as a church, as we grow bigger, we have to grow smaller. And that's why it's so important for each one of us to be a part of a small group, to be a part of a connecting group. How do we know God? We know God through fellowship with other believers. That's how we get to know him. That God uses others to reveal himself to us. So as we go through the book of Ephesians, take some time and go through it and ask God to reveal to you what he's saying to you at this season. Because I believe that God's word always speaks to our current situation. God's word always speaks to our current situation. One of the things that I love to do is I love to journal. So as I spend time in God's word, I love to write out what is he saying to me, what is God saying to me. And I get amazed, the other day I was looking back, to journals I wrote 20-something years ago. And just to see God's goodness and to see his faithfulness. You know, sometimes you can even pray about something, but along the way, God answers that prayer and you don't even realize how desperate you are when you made that prayer. It's so important that we become people who spend time in God's word, who write down the promises of God in his word. And when the storms of life come, what do we do? We go back to what God has spoken to us. And we speak God's word over us and over our lives. You see, the church at Ephesus was established on Paul's homeland journey to Jerusalem around 53 AD. And Paul would, a year later, return to this church. And he would come and spend three years there teaching them, teaching them the word of God and preaching. Over those three years he was with them, he raised up leaders. And then he left But then he would later meet with these leaders and he would send Timothy to come and become the leader of this church. It's actually the inspiration behind why Paul says to Timothy, do not let them look down on you because you are young, but set them an example. It is this specific church that Paul was referring to as Timothy came and took over this leadership. Some theologians will say that it wasn't specifically addressed to the church in Ephesus. It was addressed to the churches that were within that region. And that each of the churches, as they received the letter, they would have put in their name at the very top and then read this letter as if it was addressed to them specifically. Ephesians was most likely written when Paul was in prison in Rome. And when you think about it, here he is in prison in chains. Yet he's writing out this letter of encouragement. Here he is in a difficult situation. 
in chains for the gospel. Yet here was this man writing out all these epistles. It's made me reflect how we navigate through challenging times. Because for many of us, when you're going through a difficult time, the only thing the people around you will know is that you're going through a difficult time. Yet sometimes in the midst of our difficulty, when we are deep down in the valley, I really believe God calls us to be a voice of encouragement to those that are around us. That even in our own pain, that God can use us to be of encouragement to others. So Paul writes this letter for two reasons. Number one, to remind God's people of their new identity in Christ. He wrote to remind them that they had a new identity in Christ. And then secondly, he wrote to challenge them to embrace a different way of living. To know that they have a new identity in Christ, but also to embrace a different way of living. He was writing to, to them to say, out with the old and in with the new. He was writing to say to them, you've been set apart. Now live as those who have been set apart. It's important that you and I remind ourselves that we have a new identity in Christ. That when we become followers of Jesus Christ, we receive a new identity. Not only do we have a new identity, but we are called to live holy lives. We are called to live lives that honor and glorify our God. When you read in chapters 1 and 2, Paul writes about how the Father has elected us, how he has chosen us. He writes about the Father's predestination. He writes about the Father's adoption of us, that we have been adopted as sons and daughters. We have been adopted as children to our heavenly Father. He wants to remind this family of believers. He was writing to remind them. To remind them that, number one, they have been showered with God's kindness. Maybe you don't feel as if you're navigating through a season where you can celebrate the goodness and the faithfulness of God. But know that just by the gift of salvation, you and I have been showered with God's kindness. In fact, he writes in chapter 1 and from verse 3 of Ephesians, and he says, Praise be to the God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he has predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace which he has freely given us in the one he loves. What if you lived as one who has this understanding that you have been blessed out of the heavenly realm with every spiritual blessing? Can you imagine what would change in your life? That some of the things that you fret about, some of the things that you worry about, you no longer would worry about those things because you have this realization that we have received every spiritual blessing. He wanted them to know that they have been showered with God's kindness. The second thing he wanted them to know was that they have been chosen for greatness. Chosen for greatness. To fulfill the purposes of God in their generation. They've been showered with kindness. They've been chosen for greatness. But the third thing Paul was writing to say to them, you have been marked with the Holy Spirit. That when you accept Jesus Christ as Lord you are marked with the gift of the Holy Spirit. Not only are we marked in, in, with the Holy Spirit, he says in chapter 1, verse 13 and 14, we are marked with the Holy Spirit. But when you read on from verse 15 to 23, he goes ahead and says, you have also been filled with the Holy Spirit's power. You have also been filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. So that's a bit of a summary of chapter 1. But it's this reminder of who we are, of God's grace, of his goodness, of his faithfulness, that he is a God who has a plan and a purpose for our lives, that he is a God who has put a mark on each one of us 
that are believers, the mark of the Holy Spirit. And then he has given us the power of the Holy Spirit, the same power that brought Jesus Christ back to life from the dead, that that power is available to us. And so if we can focus a bit on chapter 2, we'll begin from verse 1. Ephesians chapter 2, we read from verse 1. It says, as for you, you are dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. He says, all of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Then he says in verse 8, he says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this not from yourselves. It is the gift of God so that no one can boast. He goes ahead and says in verse 10, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good, to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. When you think about really the whole message of chapter 2, the message of Ephesians, it's about God's grace, that we are recipients of God's grace, that we have received his grace. He begins in verse 1 and he says, As for you, as for you, you are dead in your transgressions. And when you think about it, it's so important that when we read God's word, we don't see ourselves outside of God's word, but we see ourselves in God's word. As the word of God says, as for you, as you read it, I pray that you read it and you say, as for me, as for me, I was once lost in my transgressions that we read and we place ourselves inside of Scripture. We look at God's Word and we see ourselves in it. That yes, we followed the ways of this world, that we were spiritually dead, but the grace of God has called us out of death into life. And it's so important that every so often we pause and we ask ourselves, how am I doing in my journey of faith? How am I doing in my walk with the Lord? How am I doing in my own personal journey? How am I doing in my journey of faith? And you see, Paul begins by reminding this church in Ephesus, reminding this group of believers, reminding them about the reality of personal sin. He's saying to them, you once lived a life of sin. May you never forget the kind of life that you lived. I don't know about you, the kind of life that you lived before you became a follower of Jesus Christ. But many of us, if we would confess, we would say that our lives were far away. Our lives were so far away from the heart of God, from his love and his desire for our lives. And God reached out to us where we were and he drew us to himself. Through the cross, he saved us from eternal death and damnation. Not only did, we, did God save us from eternal death, but he also granted us the gift of eternal life. The gift of eternal life in his presence. You know, I've thought about life and death quite a bit this last week. And I thought about this scripture that we quote and we read in Psalm 116 and verse 15. It says, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. But some versions say, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death 
of his faithful servants. And I've asked myself, why is it precious? But I believe it's precious because as these loved ones, these dear ones, as they step into eternity, they step into a place of rest. As they step into eternity, through the gates of death, they are victorious. And they enter into this place of eternity in the presence of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I believe that it's so important that you and I live in such a way that we know we will also finish strong. The word of God says, you were once dead because you lived a life of sin. You followed the ways of this world and the rule of the kingdom of the air. When you read in, in 1 Peter uh, chapter 5 and verse 8, it says, be self-controlled and alert. Some versions say, be sober and be alert. Be self-controlled and be alert. Why? Because your enemy, the devil, Prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. So resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of suffering. So we are not promised a life that is free from the challenges of temptation. But what we are promised is that God has given us a grace that not only saves us, but it's a grace that we can continue to depend upon to grant us victory over sin. The grace of God saves us, but the grace of God continues to be available to us to be able to have victory over sin. You see, Paul writes, you are once, you once lived a life of sin. But one of the things that I find challenging is that for many of us, we go through a season where we begin to entertain some of the things that we previously had victory over. That it's possible that you find yourself walking a journey of disobedience where some of the things that we would never have done now become such a normal part of our lives. You see, the realization of God's grace, of the saving grace of Christ, the realization of the grace of God upon our lives ought to invite you and I into a place of worship. It also ought to invite us into a place of obedience. That God desires of you and I, God desires of us worship and obedience. That's what the Lord desires from us. When you read in 1 Samuel chapter 15, from verse 22 and 23, it says, Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifice as much as in obeying the Lord? He says, To obey is better than sacrifice. And to heed is better than the fat of rams. So the realization of the grace of God upon our lives should invite us into a life of worship. And you see, worship is not just when we sing the songs. Worship is about what happens after the songs are over. What kind of life are we living? How are we relating with the people that are around us? You know? For some of us, sometimes the worship doesn't even get to the parking. You know, you live here and you get in your car there and somebody comes and cuts you off and you roll down the window and the words that come out of your lips, you don't even remember you're in a church compound. For some of us, it doesn't even get out of this sanctuary. You know, we just, we step out. It's like when we were growing up, I don't know about you, we used to be given, bought for clothes. Most likely they would be bought of like around Christmas. And these clothes would be your Sunday best for the year. Sunday best meaning you would only wear these clothes on Sunday. So they would be kept ironed clean. They'd only be worn on, not just any Sunday, special Sunday. Or when visitors, special visitors were coming. It's like the way there would be some chicken that no one can touch until when visitors come. And there would be some cutlery, some utensils that nobody uses until when they are visitors. And to say the truth, for some of us, our Christian faith is like our Sunday best. We wear it on Sunday morning. And when we come to church, we are there. We are in the zone. But the moment we step out of here, we go back into the challenging world and we meet the world at the same level that it comes to us. 
For some of us, our faith doesn't even make it to Sunday morning, to Monday morning. The faith of Sunday morning does not make it through our Monday morning fire. Somehow, there is this disconnect and this tension between who God has called us to be and the life that we live. And what I find as a challenge is that for many of us, we are first of all something else before we are believers. You know, that we have this cultural identity that we bear, that is expressed in our political opinions, it is expressed in the decisions we are making. For some of us, that cultural identity is what defines even the choice of who we marry. And we must ask ourselves, which identity are we living out? Are we living out that identity of being sons and daughters of the Most High King? Or are we living out a different identity? Are there areas of our lives that we have not fully submitted to the Lordship of Jesus Christ? Are we broken? Are we compassionate? Even to those around us who maybe might be battling with sin, do we see them through the lens of God's love? Are we living a life that is fully and wholly surrendered before God? Because as we navigate through life, as we navigate through this journey of faith, every single day when we wake up in the morning, we have to wake up aware of the grace of God upon our lives, aware of who God has called us to be, aware of what Christ has paid on the cross, the price that has already been paid for us on the cross. You know, when I wake up in the morning, I don't wake up as a Luya Maragoli man. I wake up in the morning, and the most important thing I need to remember the morning I get up is that I am a child of God. I have been saved by the grace of God. The blood of Jesus Christ has been shed at the cross at Calvary. And so everything that I do is through that lens of the realization that Christ has died for me on the cross. That Jesus Christ died on the cross for me. That I have a new identity. That I'm called to live a different way. And so once I'm aware of this identity that I have and that I'm called to a new standard, I therefore don't relate with my wife as a traditional African man. I relate my, with my wife as a child of God, knowing that God has entrusted her to me to relate with, to be an expression of his love, to serve her. I relate with my children through this understanding that I'm a child of God, saved by his grace. I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. When I show up in the office, I relate with the people that are in the office in the same way. When I open up my business, I relate with them in the same way. When I'm chairing that board meeting, when I'm in that conversation, I have this awareness that I'm first of all a follower of Jesus Christ. And what that does is that it helps you and I to be so intentional and careful in how we live. Paul talks about this grace, that we have been saved by grace, not by works. We have been saved by the grace of God. And what he's saying is that we cannot earn our way to salvation. Salvation is not a reward of good deeds. Salvation is by the grace of God. But the fact that salvation is by the grace of God does not mean that we can continue living a life of sin. When we become aware of the grace of God upon our lives, do you know what it does? It frees you and I. It frees you and I. And we seek to live for God in every single thing that we do. When we realize the precious grace of God that has come upon our lives, we no longer take the grace of God for granted. But we live with an awareness of this grace that is upon our lives. Because what I find is that we are living a life where there is a dichotomy between our faith and who we are. That yes, I believe Jesus Christ is Lord over my life, that he has saved me by his grace. 
but there's a dichotomy because I'm still willing to entertain sin in my life. And you see, sin has a subtle way of finding its way into our lives. Sometimes it's the things that we entertain, the things that we are comfortable with that lead us into sin. You don't just wake up one day and you plan to go and have an affair. It's the conversations we entertain. Conversations outside the boundaries of marriage, outside the boundaries of relationship. There are conversations that you, the moment you begin to have those conversations outside of your marriage, outside of the right relationship, then it becomes a path that leads to sin. There are things that we expose ourselves to, you know, that we expose ourselves to with our eyes, with our ears, with our minds. The things that we say that lead us into a place of sin. And sometimes it's good things, you know. Sometimes it's things that start off as good things. I remember growing up in our home, we had this small television. But I remember once or twice a week, there would be days when our mom would say to us, whatever I need to do for you as a family, by 7.30, make sure I've done for you. Because after 7.30, you don't have a mother. Because after 7.30, she'll be watching this program. There was a program called No One But You. I can see some of you are also victims. There was a program called The Rich Also Cry. And so we would sit there and watch this program with mom. And of course she was our excuse initially and then we also became addicts. And she would cry. And I would say, mom, why are you crying? And she would say, can't you see how they're mistreating this little girl? And I said, yeah, mom, but they're just acting. You know? And she would be so broken. She said, this girl is blind. They're just taking advantage of her. And then for a whole week, there would be all this tension as she's waiting for what's going to happen <laughs> next week. You know, in this generation, we don't have to wait for the next episode next week. <laughs> you know, Netflix has made sure we can pack you up with the 12 episodes and just watch it. And the media has become such an influence in our lives. And the media is watering down our values. Our value system. You know? And you look at the values. These days you watch, you know, something that is, looks so good. And then along the way, there's this character who shows up, who has all these values. You begin to question, should I continue watching? So it's what we entertain. It's what we entertain that slowly begins to water down our value system. What we allow. You know, Jesus said to the disciples, it's not about what you eat. It's about what goes in. What goes into your heart. What you listen to. What you see. It's about what goes in. And for many of us, we are allowing ourselves. That which we know is not right has now become okay for us. And that which you entertain, what one generation entertains, becomes a new normal in the next generation. Right now we are having all this conversation about the LGBTQ. And as a society, we are beginning to say, you know what, this is okay. And we have to be careful. We have to be careful because what we begin to entertain, the generation that comes after us will find as normal. You go in the West, there are places where pastors, religious leaders, are actually conducting weddings of gay couples. What we make normal, the generations that come after us, will accept as normal. So you and I must ask ourselves, what are we allowing to feed our soul? You see, the soul is like the body. We have to ask ourselves, what are we feeding our soul? Are there things we have allowed that we have normalized? You know? When I was growing up, if somebody was looking for pornography, you'd have to go to the ends of the earth to get any pornographic content. Right now, just on your phone, you know, right on your phone, you have access. 
And for some of us, we need to lift those phones before the Lord and say, you know what, we have sinned. You know? And the smartphones have not made it any easier. That what we are exposing ourselves to, what we are watching, is not edifying. You know? It's not stuff that honors and glorifies God. The words that we speak from our lips, are they edifying? Are they lifting? When you come into the room and you spend time with people, you need to ask yourself, when you step out of the room, have you lifted hope in that room? Have you lifted faith in that room? Have you been salt and light in that room? Have you been salt and light in that room? We have to ask ourselves, the fact that we have been saved by grace, does it mean we should then continue to live in sin? No. In fact, quite the very opposite. The understanding of God's grace, of the grace that has been extended to us, ought to be a call to live godly lives, to live holy lives. And that's why Paul writes and says that you've not just been saved by your works. You've not been saved by your works. You've been saved by grace. So that you should not boast. Because you can be spiritually proud. Do you know that you can become spiritually proud? Yes. We can become spiritually proud. And what spiritual pride does is that it makes us look down upon those who are struggling with what we feel as if we have overcome. So we feel we are above. Because I'm not battling with alcoholism, I'm above that person. Because I'm not battling in this area, I'm above that person. But that's not the case. Because when you look at somebody and they're battling in their journey, they're battling with an addiction, they're battling with something, we should look at them and say, that is me if it wasn't for the grace of God upon my life. If it wasn't for God's grace upon my life. And so rather than being spiritually prideful, we have compassion and we can pray and stand in the gap over this person. You see, Paul was writing to this church in Ephesus. There were two groups of believers there. There were Jewish believers and there were also the Greeks the Jewish believers were prideful. They were prideful because of what they did. Because they fasted. Because they gave. Because they followed the law of Moses. And so when they came into this place of fellowship, they would feel superior. Why? Because of the Mosaic law that they subscribed to. But the Greeks would also come and they would feel prideful. Yes, they were believers, but they would feel prideful because for them it was about knowledge. It was about position. It was about power. It was about authority. And so their pride was built out of who they were. So one group was spiritually pride, proud because of how they saw themselves in the eyes of God. The other group was proud because of how they saw themselves in the eyes of man. And we can be spiritually proud but I believe that God does not call you and I to be spiritually proud. He calls us to be aware of who we are in him. But not to be prideful. I believe that what is required of us is a posture of brokenness. Because brokenness goes beyond humility. Brokenness goes beyond repentance. Brokenness actually leads us to humility and repentance. Brokenness leads us in such a way that we live every single day so broken before God that we do not desire to do anything that is outside of his will for our lives. We are seeking to be in tune with him, to hear from him. Brokenness, brokenness leads us into a posture of prayer. Brokenness leads us into a place of dependence on God. We learn to depend on him. Brokenness is about emptying ourselves of all that we are to allow God to fill us with himself emptying ourselves of all that we are to allow God to fill us with himself. I don't know about you, but when I look at the world around me, we live in a world where it's so easy to be full of ourselves. To be so full of ourselves until there is no room for God's grace to flow upon our lives. We live in a world that is so driven. You know, it's about who I am what I have done, what I want, that we can be so full of ourselves. But brokenness says I come and I submit myself. In a world that says who are the self-made men, 
who are those who are self-reliant, who are those who are all-knowing. We come and we say, you know what, we, f- we fully depend on our God. We need him. He is all that we need. That we are not self-reliant, we are not self-made, we are not all-knowing. But we live by the grace and power of God. And we desire to submit to him in everything that we do. In Psalm 51, verse 17, the word of God tells us, a broken and contrite spirit he will not despise. So when we are broken before him, what does God do? He comes and he lifts us. And he begins to fill us with his vision, fill us with his dreams. He opens our eyes, not just to see what's happening around us, but to see in the spiritual realm what he desires to do and accomplish. We must empty ourselves of our pride, of our flesh desires, of our selfish ambition, and allow ourselves to be filled with the Spirit of God. You see what brokenness does? Is that brokenness requires a release of the grip on an area of our life that we have not fully yielded to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Brokenness requires that which we have held on to, that we choose to release to him. That you release your sexuality to him. You release your relationships to him. You release your business to him. You release your work to him. You release all that you are to him. And rather than saying, God, do according to my will, we come and we surrender and we say, Lord, we desire your will in our lives. We humble ourselves. We repent of our sin. And we choose to allow ourselves to be used of him for his glory and for his name. And what brokenness does is that when we are broken before God, then it leads through a process of separation and cleansing. And then we become vessels that God can use as he sanctifies us and as he works in us. You see, brokenness is when our hearts become sensitive. Sensitive before God and open to his work in our hearts and our lives. Where we are so open to what God desires to do. That we don't take his grace for granted. But our hearts become so sensitive towards him. And when our hearts become sensitive towards the things of God then we don't embrace a lifestyle that is sinful, but we seek to live a life that honors and glorifies God. That we seek to live a life that is broken before him. I am so convicted that we are going through a season where God is leading us through a point of transition, that there is a shift that's taking place in the spiritual realm that there is an outpouring of the power of the Holy Spirit across the earth. But I believe that what God is looking for is vessels that he can use. Vessels that he can use. That's all God is looking for. Empty vessels that he can use. And my challenge to you is that you would make yourself an empty vessel. That your confession would become not my will, but your will be done. That you'd allow the grace of God and it's not about living out of the flesh. It's not about doing what we want anymore. I was speaking to a young man a couple of weeks ago. He said to me, this is really what I want to do. I've considered everything, and this is what I want to do. And I said to him, we stopped doing what we want to do a long time ago. I stopped doing what I want to do years ago. Because it's, a, it's not about what I want to do. It's about what is it that is God's will for me in this season of my life. It's about what is it that is God's will for me in my family. What is it that is his will for me where he's positioned me. What is it that is his will for me right now in the things that is placed in my hands. That is not about what I can do. It's about walking in the grace of God. It's not by might. It's not by power. It's by his spirit. It's not about what we want but it's about the will of God upon our lives. And I want to challenge you to surrender your life to the will of God upon your life. To receive the grace of God. Maybe you've never confessed Jesus Christ as Lord over your life. That you would receive his grace. Not only would you receive his grace, that you would yield to his lordship and allow him to be Lord. Are there things that have not been surrendered to him? Let's go ahead and surrender to him. Say, Lord, today, you know what? I surrender to you. My heart has been far away from you. I surrender to you. This is an area of my life I have not submitted to you. For some of us, it's our finances. But you say, I submit to your lordship. 
not my will, but your will be done for your glory and for your name. Heavenly Father, we come and we sit in your presence. And your word tells us that we once were walking in darkness, but by your grace you have saved us. You have called us, not because of works, not because of anything we have done, but because of your mercy and your grace. And now, Lord, I pray that your grace would, <coughs> would surround each one of us. Let your grace surround each one of us. Let your grace surround us, O oh God. Surround us with your grace. Where there is hopelessness, Lord, I speak a new hope. Where there is despair, Lord, I speak a new hope in the name of Jesus. Where there is brokenness, Father, would you bring healing? We come before you with open hearts and open hands. Do a new work in us. Forgive us of the words of our lips. Forgive us of the thoughts of our minds. Forgive us of our eyes. Forgive us, O oh God, when our bodies have not been honoring before you. Forgive us, O oh God, when we have not been salt and light where you have planted us, O oh God. Forgive us in our homes where we have not honored our spouses. Forgive us when we have not been the example to our children. Father, would you forgive us? Forgive us in our workplaces when we have embraced a life of compromise. Father, would you forgive us? Would you forgive us, oh God? Would you have mercy upon us? Forgive us. Cleanse us. Lord, cleanse us today. And do a new work in us. In that place of prayer, you would say, you know what, my heart is so far away from the Lord. Yes, you're born again, but your heart has been drawn away, so far away. And you're saying, yes, this morning I come, but my heart is not right with the Lord. I desire to experience him afresh. If that's your cry, that's your prayer, would you just lift up your hand where you are? You're saying, I need to start over today. I want to start over today. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe for you, you've never accepted Jesus Christ as Lord over your life. Just, so just lift up your hand. Just hold your hand up. Don't put it down. Just hold it up. You're saying, Lord, I need you. I confess you as Lord today. And I need you. I want a new beginning today. Let's pray this prayer together. Say, Lord Jesus, thank you for your love that you died on the cross for me. You shed your blood that I would receive forgiveness. Thank you for your grace upon my life. Forgive me of my sin. I choose you as Lord over my life. Take my hand and lead me and guide me in your ways. In Jesus' name, amen. We serve a God who is so faithful. We serve a God who is so good. And God is looking for men that he can use. God is looking for women that he can use. And I want to pray that you will be that man. You will be that woman in your family, in your home, in your workplace, in your business. You will choose to be that man. You will choose to be that woman. You will choose to be that man, that woman that God can use for his own glory and for his own name. Amen. Let's give our Lord Jesus all the praise. Let's give him all the glory. Thank you for joining us today. If you'd like more information about ICC Nairobi, you can follow us on all our social media platforms, that is Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and TikTok at ICC underscore Nairobi or our website iccnairobi.org. Be sure to subscribe and share this podcast with your family and friends. Until next time.